minutes the chair recognizes um Gene, Gene Tyler, Chairman of Valley County. I am definitely against this. I spent 35 years on active duty. I commanded, I, I've been in four combat deployments. Commanded in two, was an enlisted man in two. My daughter is a lieutenant colonel undergoing her ninth deployment. So I know where I'm speaking from. This resolution will give not one iota of dignity and respect to soldiers, period. Most soldiers would loathe to see this because they know this is a political action that shouldn't be happening at this level. Our commander in chief has the authority to do it and he will do it when he's ready. But we do not need some resolution because as a commander, as a senior commander that deployed over there, I would, I, would, I would have much trouble with my soldiers, with them having to think, do my people back at home support me like this? And we went to war the right way. I don't care what you say, we went to war the right way. Thank you. So I'm Gene Tyler, I'm the chairman of the Valley County Republican Central Committee. I came today for the State Central Committee uh, summer meeting where we go over rules and regulations and take care of housekeeping business. And you're also a military veteran, retired soldier for life, but uh, please give us your military resume. So uh, my background is uh, retired military, spent a, a little over 35 years on active duty. Uh, was enlisted and officer. I did two combat tours in Vietnam as an enlisted man, and I did two combat tours um, uh, in the in the desert uh, as an officer, commanding a CJTF. Combined Joint Task Force. In what role specifically? Well, I was the commander of the task force, and so. What was your rank at that point? At that time, I was a lieutenant colonel. I had uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines on the task force, plus I had an Australian soldier, thus the combined. Right, so, right. yeah, and we were doing, we did the comms, I did the communications bringing it from the states into theater for the commander in chief of, of the operation. All right, so today there was a very heated debate, it, was a, it seemed like one of the most contentious issues today, on a resolution to support the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. And I, I don't want to get too bogged down in the resolution and the, the, the wording and, and, and the significance of that, but that this is a civilian political body. Right exercising what in America the, is the traditional civilian oversight of the military saying we would like a change in this policy and and you spoke out uh, against the resolution why is that sir so you, you just made a couple of great points I mean first of all a previous supporter said it'll give dignity honor and respect to our troops no resolution that we ever will make at this well, level I'm, I'm with you there well, it's not it's not gonna take it away or right. give it it's, it's not, yeah. right but the other thing is the president already has all the authority to withdraw soldiers from any theater of operation. So he doesn't need a resolution from us. That's one point. The other point is, it gets very confusing to soldiers. When you got soldiers that may go into battle and die, say, why should I go into battle and die when they're talking at home about pulling us back? The, the, the civil military connection isn't resolutions coming from home that may impact a tactical strategic or operational level um, element. So, so our civil uh, um, leadership is the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Army, or Secretary of the various services. We take our orders from that person. That's where that component comes in. It's not the political body in Idaho or Texas or Wyoming or somewhere else. It's strictly the chain of command or the commander-in-chief himself yes I, I just said I said that earlier the, the, the president of the United States has the authority to withdraw us at any time and he'll do that when he thinks it's time 
So you, you would, would you be critical of Donald Trump for saying the same thing as has been said here for him as a, a Republican presidential candidate saying that we were lied into Iraq and that we should get the troops out of Iraq and that these wars have gone on too long? Would, would the, the criticism that you just leveled against the Idaho GOP here or the people who voted for this resolution, at least here, would you say that that applies to Trump himself? No, he's the commander in chief. He sets the policy. He, he gives the ultimate orders. He's the boss, so he can do that. So now, he can say whatever he wants, but we, as, as, as the political base of his support, shouldn't ever criticize that. We, can, we could recommend, but make a resolution to say we need to get out. I, it's, it's not really good policy. He knows. He gets counsel from, his, from our senators and, and congressmen that are there in D.C. And for us to uh, forward a resolution as if all the people in Idaho are for us getting out. All the people are not in well, Idaho. No, the, the resolution was really the, the Central no, no. Committee. Then I want to make one other okay. point. Uh, you said we were lied into getting into Iraq. That wasn't a lie. I mean, it, it, it turned out that we didn't find any weapons of mass destruction, but there's a difference between having faulty intelligence and an out-and-out -out lie. That's two completely different things. So we went into Iraq, which started this, this, the current war against the terrorist situation we're into now, under the right premise at the time that turned out to be we didn't find that stuff. But just because we didn't find something doesn't mean we have to withdraw everything right then and there. We, we need to do the right things to protect our national interests and our national well-being and our soldiers that are on the ground. Okay, so do you understand uh, the founder's position about a standing army? I fully understand it. I think I probably understand it better than most senior army officers. I mean, I was a senior army officer. The, 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 mili the military comes under civil military control, but that doesn't mean John Q. Public out there gets to come up and order us around. That, that's, I'm sorry, that's not what I'm referring to, sir. I, I, that, means, that means the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Army are our civilian leadership. And, and the, I, I don't know what other premise you're saying other than sure. that only Congress can declare war, right. but we didn't declare war. We've, you know, a, what a lot of people don't understand is they think this is a new concept where we go overseas like this. Throughout the history of our founding, to go back to the- Shores of Tripoli. Yeah, the, our, the Bar, our Barnaby Pilot, uh, Pirate days. You know, the military had to do what they had to do, and we didn't go back to Congress to vote on it to do something. Well, you know, so what I was referring to was the founders' opposition to the concept of a standing army, that they favored a militia-based defense that was of, by, and for the people, yeah. rather than a socialized defense service. Yeah. So that, if, if, if this is the free market answer, right, and we support free market principles, that is people coming together voluntarily to, to, to bring resources together to achieve a common purpose, that socializing something, right? That having it socialized, like socialized medicine or socialized whatever it is, that that takes away those market forces and that that's what militarization has done. When the Revolutionary War was won by guerrilla fighting, it was won by people who believed in the cause. And, and no, that- well, It was a little bit more than guerrilla fighting. It was a large standing army that defeated the British. Trust me, it wasn't guerrilla fighting. Yes, there were guerrilla fi fighting. The, the Green well, we Mountain win by standing, standing line in line and, and shooting each other in the face. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. What do you, what do you think Yorktown was about? What do you, what do you, what do you, battles like that? A lot of battles like that. The yes, advantage in the Revolutionary yeah. War that the revolutionaries had was that we didn't have to stand in lines wearing red coats and make it really easy to shoot our, shoot yeah. us. Now, yeah, you're, you're partially right. The, <laughs> the advantage we had okay. was the logistical advantage of them having to bring all their stuff over here to fight on our turf. Okay, so that was our okay, advantage. I want, I want to ask just a couple bigger questions then. We got philosophical here for a second then. But I want to address the one point that you made. Nowhere in, in, in any of the documentation does it say we can't have a standing army. We've had a standing army, and it's been passed through con proper congressional channels. What we opposed was the European style. That's why these are subtle little things, but you know what the highest rank is in the military? You're probably going to tell me three or four star. Commander-in-chief. No, I mean military rank, the highest military rank. 
The highest military rank is a two-star. Three-star and four-star are political appointments. That's and when, and, and, right? and when, when a four-star doesn't have a billet, a position to, to fill, he reverts back to two-star. A lot of people don't realize that. When a four-star gets ready to retire, if Congress does nothing, he retires as a two-star. He doesn't retire as a four-star. That are, are small, subtle things that we instituted that were uh, showed our opposition to large standing armies like the Europeans had. But never did we say you couldn't have a large standing army. It's never been said in our, our founding documents. Right, well, because it was, I'm talking about the founders, not the framers, the people who actually said screw you to the king, not the people who created a new central authority. So for them, so I'm, I want to ask you two, two big philosophical questions, if you don't mind, and then I'm, I'm going to give you the last word. Okay. Uh, but the, the first one is that th th there were a number of founders. You say it's not in the documents, certainly not in the official documents, but it's well documented that a number of the founders specifically opposed any kind of standing army and that they preferred a militia-based defense. Why do you prefer socialized defense over free market defense? Well, I, I've, I've never heard these, this term, socialized defense. Well, you've heard of socialized medicine, right? And, and free market defense. I will tell you this. We, we, our founding fathers, did not believe in large standing armies. But define large standing armies. There were subtle things that they did that protected against that. But we still have an army, and we always will. And, and it even says in, in our founding documents to raise an army and a navy. So, yes, we... You we forgot the Marine Corps. I know we're Department of the Navy, but we don't like it being referred to as that. And we're, we're older than the Constitution. You know that Tun Tavern, 1775, right? Yeah. The Re Marine Corps was always considered, <laughs> back in those days, part of the Navy. So, what, what's your other question? All right. So, when is it okay to use violence against another person? Against another person? Well, now, uh, so you're talking about another nation or just a person? Well, from an individual to an individual or a group of individuals to another group of individuals, what's the moral concept that defines for you when is it okay to use violence against another person? Well, if somebody is threatening me or my family, I'm going to take the appropriate action to negate that violence or to, or to uh, cover it. So if it means if someone takes a swing at me, I'm going to swing back. And so, you know, I, I'm not a, a warmongering person, but I'm not going to stand for my family to be harmed, my friends to be harmed, and myself to be harmed. And that's kind of the same philosophy we use in, in our national defense concepts. We protect ourselves, and we protect our self-interests, and we protect our enemies that align with us. Okay, so you said your daughter did nine tours, is that right? Is she... My daughter is retiring uh, in about 10 months. She's done nine tours, yes. I, w I would hope that you would think that nine tours would, would be a demonstration of the futility and the lack of a clear moral purpose of, of, of addressing a threat. And, and the fact that, I mean, I, I only did one tour, uh, but for me that was enough to see that, that I didn't want to be a part of it. So, sir, I really appreciate your time and, and, and your willingness to engage thoughtfully. I'll give you the last words. Is there anything you want to say to, to our audience? We have a lot of veterans watching. No, the only thing I say is, is you know, you, you, you have to really think globally. If you think if you think very myoptically, one, one particular issue, then you might miss the bigger picture. And do I want my daughter to have to go back again? Absolutely not. But do I know she may have to? Yes. Do I want my daughter to come home in a casket? Absolutely not. But did I know there was a possibility? Yes. You know, did I want that to happen to me? I spent 35 years doing that. I'm a professional soldier, still am, just happen to be retired. And my daughter's a professional soldier, so she does what she has to do, and she takes her orders from her chain of command, and not from some state central committee. Uh, well, thank you, Sir Jane. I really appreciate it. Adam vs. the Man is made possible by people who care about freedom, like our Patreon supporters whose monthly contributions get them perks and exclusive content. Find out how you can help by going to patreon.com slash Adam versus the man.